Okay, thank you so much, John. And uh, hello to everybody out there in the uh, internet land. So uh, yes, yeah, so this is gonna be a, a webinar talk on biosensor game testing. And uh, so the subtitle is all about the question. Uh, so we're gonna be investigating some approaches and techniques and tools that you can use in order to improve your uh, game testing scenarios. Uh, now there've been other talks here uh, today, uh, there's one at two o'clock on galvanic skin response. Uh, there's uh, some other people that have used eye tracking and things like that before in the past. Uh, but this is going to assume that uh, most of you are just a little bit familiar with it or, or really haven't uh, uh, seen too much of it. But you've heard a little bit about it and you might want to try to implement it. And uh, these are going to address some of the, the, the approaches, the pitfalls, and, and some tips in order to get the most out of those approaches as you go in. So uh, before we get started, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Nam, and I'm a neuroscience and cognitive uh, specialist at a company called iMotions. Um, I have a background in neuroscience and cognitive psychology. I actually did my thesis on um, making uh, decisions in video games back in uh, a long, long time ago using the Torque game engine, if you remember that. Um, and then I was essentially using video games uh, to investigate different psychological phenomenon, memory, decision making, um, the way that uh, cues kind of influence you. Um, and since then, I've, uh, I've kind of bounced around and I've most recently landed with uh, iMotions here, where um, if you're not familiar with iMotions, it creates a software that makes it easier for a variety of researchers to use different types of approaches out there. So uh, whether you're interested in, in gaining eye tracking or uh, incorporating like brain waves or breathing rates and stuff like that, uh, they, they make it easy to, you to, uh, to incorporate all this information. And what I do is I help train and set up laboratories, consult uh, companies in order to help them execute their research. And these can include things like neuromarketing. I've been lucky enough to work with UX companies, consumer goods, automotive, aviation, and virtual reality, as well as a, a number of game studios from, uh, from mobile development game companies like Casual Games to, uh, to mid-tier games to uh, you know, the AAA titles that are out there. Um, and so I've been able to help them set up their laboratories and, and gain the insights and, and some of the analytic approaches that they're looking to try to do. And I'm just kind of hoping to, uh, to give you some of the insights that I've gained working with some of these clients before. Now, um, you know, in order to show these insights, I'm going to be showing some of the company's software. I'm not going to try to too much plug the software too much there. Uh, so I'll kind of tell you some of these other approaches that you might look to use, some of the independent softwares that are there as well. Uh, but I'll be diving into uh, to the iMotion software here and there just to kind of prove the, uh, the methodology points that I'm going to try to make. Um, so first off, why are game developers going into bio data and recording biometric data in general? So uh, from talking to the clients that I've worked with, um, there's, a, there's some worries in the traditional uh, testing methods out there. And we've all seen sort of some of the lessons from some of the big game houses where like, you know, they're, they're huge companies with, with tremendous testing resources. They've been in the game for a long time and they know how to test games, but somehow they still create a game and when they release it, it gets killed in, in, in release uh, due to poor player experiences, a feature or something doesn't get quite rolled out in the way that they wanted to. Uh, so what they, they've talked to me about is that there, there might be some inherent issues in, in the traditional methodologies. And so when you're like asking a, a paid participant to come into your, your house and play your game and you ask them, you know, is this a good game? There might be some biases, uh, other reasons in there that, that, that yield uh, results that might not be uh, what you need when you actually go out to release them. Uh, a second reason some people might be moving into uh, uh, game-based biometrics is that you know gaming in general is just sort of changing so uh, when you look at things like low commitment games free-to-play games or casual games they're sort of different animals from these games that uh, you have to like you know pay 40 50 80 dollars for and then you have that that sort of uh, commitment bias of saying I, I bought this I hope it's a good game um, and so these new factors that drive the adoption for the first time user experience, the cinematic and the social impacts have a lot of influence on whether or not um, someone then chooses to, to adopt the game and continue playing with it. And so some of these uh, uh, producers are looking to try to maximize the impact of all these things and understand it at a deeper level. So what do you get out of the biological signals that, that you can add on to and augment your, your approaches? So what they do is they, they give you additional insights. So it's not there to replace uh, a traditional questionnaire-based user testing by any means, but uh, it can kind of give you more information about what can happen there. So it can increase objectivity and consistency in your testing, and it can give you a, a deeper understanding in the moment-by-moment -moment understanding of different reactions to content out there. 
Um, I kind of give the uh, the example of uh, pretend that when you're developing a game, it's like trying to craft a good story. If you're an uh, an author there trying to create the next good book, you might you know get a bunch of uh, testers in and say, hey. Uh, can you tell me about the last really good book that you read so that I can understand what is a good book to you, a good story to you, and then, you know, try to, try to repeat some of those same methodologies. And they might be able to, to then, re you know, reply, you know, oh, yeah, that was this really good book that I read. Can you describe some of the things that were really good about it and, and ask them, like, you know, what they can remember? But again, that's biased on things like their memory, uh, what they read most recently, uh, what, uh, what they can remember actually going from moment by moment, what they saw first. And there'll be a lot of sort of missteps going in there and what uh, biological data does and adds on to it is that imagine you could as they were reading that book reading that story tag every word every page in the correct order and how much of, of a response they're having across the entire thing in order to get a good story and how much how much richer your understanding of what your uh, what drives a, a good experience for that person would be and that's what I, I say that uh, you know these physiological tools will bring to the table when you're looking at these types of uh, testing procedures Um, and so why biosensors? So biosensors allow researchers to take a variety of different approaches, but you, you need to know what questions are actually able to be tied into different biosensors. Uh, Heather, I'll address your, your question on the next slide coming up in, in just a moment. Uh, but what they are is that each sensor actually has uh, specific questions that, that they can answer. So you can't just throw in a general, is this game good question at everything and expect to get a good response. Uh, but by understanding the fundamental parts of each of the, the tools, you're able to then actually ask the appropriate questions to actually improve your game experience. So uh, things like, you know, motivation, cognitive workload, um, affecting choices could be approached by something like EEG, if you're looking into that, so brainwave technology. Uh, is this information important? Could be addressed with uh, skin conductance or galvanic skin response, uh, is, if you know the terminology, which is measuring the sweat on your skin. Uh, things like, you know, can I, can I verbally explain my process? The, the, the sort of um, declarative memory information, that can be addressed with observational surveys and reports and, and asking them, oh, you know, what, what do you remember? What can you see? And it's still a very uh, important part of the, uh, the, the research process. Um, attentional processes, did you notice key info? Did you miss something? Did I put in other types of, of elements there that, that, you know, I thought would drive it in a certain way, uh, but it ended up not going in that way? Um, could be addressed with eye tracking technology. And we'll go into these in, in just a bit more detail uh, in just a moment. And then finally, am I reacting positively or negatively to, uh, to my scenario? So we can use uh, facial expression analysis there. So actually doing facial coding going in through that. And I'll show some examples live. So I'm gonna try to minimize the, uh, the slides here and actually work more into the data set as much as I can. And then finally, there's other types of variances that might be accounted for out there looking at context and location and such. So uh, in order to sort of describe this process, I am actually going to do a little sample pilot project on Counter-Strike uh, Go. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, I am an old school CS Go player from back in 2000. Um, and, uh, I, you know, back DE Dusk, DE Aztec days. And uh, I haven't played it in like, you know, whatever, 20 something years, God. Uh, but you know, I've heard so much good things about CSGO. I thought, hey, I'm in lockdown, why not jump on, I'll play it, and then analyze my, my sort of first time user experience in this new game uh, through the lens of the neuroscience approaches that, that I've done before. And so what I'll be doing is I'll be uh, just using some uh, eye tracking, uh, some facial expression analysis, and some skin response in order to just kind of take you through uh, the process. What are some of the pitfalls that you get when you get the shiny new toy and you get this data and you're like, well, what do I do with this data? How does that actually help me improve my game? And then uh, some of the processes that actually can move you forward into the, uh, to where you want to go. Uh, I know there's another talk later on on skin response, so I'm probably gonna keep that one just a bit shorter. Um, so let's start off with, uh, with eye tracking. So um, I could start off uh, trying to you know, explain to you the, uh, the vast array of the complex eye tracking uh, neural pathways and the dorsal ventral who and what where pathway, the different ventral layers and going into it. But instead, I am going to do what everyone does these days to actually learn anything, which is point at a YouTube content. 
so if uh, you're familiar with this, uh, some people on YouTube, uh, some content creators have done what's called the eye tracker challenge. And this is the most familiar probably to, to you out there where uh, they, they have uh, essentially attached an eye tracker onto their monitors, uh, throw in a variety of provocative content and then try to, to uh, in full knowledge that their eye tracking behavior is being uh, out there for everyone to see. They try to review the content and then they you know, try to control what they look at and fail miserably uh, a lot of the times. What this is sort of underlying uh, at and, and kidding at is that there are a variety of different tool uh, factors that actually impact the way that uh, what you pay attention to, and not all of them are under your conscious control. Uh, a lot of them uh, will have to do with different types of psychophysics, what pops out at you. Um, uh, I'm not going to get into the top-down versus bottom-up aspects of all that. There's a variety of, of books and manuals and, and things out there. But th what the, the point is that there's an underlying uh, science behind it, that if you understand the way that things are sort of broken down, you can help control the way that your story sort of unfolds. And, and going back to that book concept, it's very easy to sort of control what people see because everything happens in order. When there are multiple elements on the screen and you're trying to tell a story by going from A to B to C, uh, it's very difficult because you don't control which objects they look at in what order. And so by looking and testing with eye tracking data, you're able to then get sort of a greater control of that story that you're looking to try to unfold. So what are the tools? So if, uh, if you're familiar with these tools, then, then, um, then this is great. But for those of you that are new to it, essentially, uh, there's a variety of different uh, assets that are out there that can help you do eye tracking. Most of these are would be pretty familiar with you. Uh, if you're familiar with Toby products or Smart Eye products, um, you can see that these are a variety of bars that you can fix to the bottom of the monitor. Uh, there's bars that you can fit onto bottoms of large screen TVs and sit on a couch about seven feet away and, and track it there. Um, additionally, there's also eye tracking glasses and, and now there's virtual reality headsets with, with integrated eye tracking there as well. And so there's a variety of different tools that will meet your need at different uh, cost levels out there. And the question is like, you know, is it good enough for me to get the accuracy I need to, to track what I'm looking for? And these are some of the things that you need to do when you're shopping for, for these types of tools. The questions would be like, you know, how big are the items that you're looking to track on? How much accuracy, how quickly uh, things are flashing on the screen in order for you to, to get good insights? And, and that's sort of dependent upon your, your specific use case need. I will kind of address that uh, you want to be careful of uh, webcam-based eye trackers for now. Um, so there are software options out there that you can just download. You may have seen them before uh, that you can just run as, as plugins or software programs that utilize the webcam here. Um, but so far, I haven't seen any, uh, any of them work to the degree of accuracy I need in order to get insights from for gaming. Uh, there as well. Uh, now, there, not to be that there might be some secret awesome software out there, but I just haven't seen it run across my, my desk as of right now. That being said, all these eye trackers work functionally the same if, if you're kind of curious. So essentially, they have a camera built in, but additionally, they have light sources to actually draw anchor points on the eyes. And this helps the software figure out, okay, well, within a couple of you know, pixels on the screen where that person is looking in high accuracy and then takes into account things like head movements and stuff very nicely. And you can look into, uh, into that. Uh, let me actually uh, dive into the gameplay. Again, I want to try to keep this a little bit uh, less PowerPoint centric onto itself. So I'm going to again dive into some software. And again, this could be a wide variety of different visualization softwares that are out there uh, that you can go into. And, and they're going to have a largely a uh, very similar set of, of eye tracking metrics. Let me actually uh, change the color here to something a bit more uh, easy to see. Uh, but if you're not familiar with uh, the way that sort of eye movements are sort of uh, structured, um, there essentially there are two sort of classes of, of eye movements. There's uh, these darting around movements where you're trying to locate your next target, and those are represented by these lines, and those in the, uh, in the literature are known as saccades or saccades, uh, depending upon your accent. And then uh, when you're actually stopping to look at something to process that information for a moment in time, you'll get a little uh, location here as a circle, and those are called fixations. And what's defined as a fixation uh, kind of varies from, from study to study, but there's a typical threshold of so many milliseconds, 100, 250, 300 milliseconds that has to be looked at within a certain area before you're fixating, processing that information, and understanding that information um, there. And you can then look at it in a variety of different uh, uh, scenarios, overlays, visualizations, uh, which I'll get into next. But as you can see, uh, you know, when you buy the software, the, the tendency is, oh, I'll, I'll be able to track what I'm looking at. And then you get this plot and you're like, well, 
how does this help me improve that interface? And so that's where uh, some of the clients have fallen to some of these pitfalls. And so what, uh, let me go back to the uh, program education. So what you to understand how you actually pull value out of the, uh, the data set, you should probably look at what type of outputs are traditionally out there for eye tracking data. So as you saw before, there's the gaze plot. And inside the gaze plot, you get uh, things like numbers that will tell you uh, the order. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there might be something like uh, you want to understand like what the, the actual things are looking at in the order so that you can understand sort of the emotional unfurling of which object they look at and how they're affecting the, the, the way that they're perceiving the, the screen here, starting with one, then two, then three, and four, and such. Uh, here, the, the circles then also represent how long they actually look at a specific uh, object in time. The larger the circle, uh, the longer they look at it. And this can also be color, uh, depending upon which software you use. Um, a lot of the eye trackers that are out there uh, have their own technologies for you to help visualize this, but this is um, one of the options that we have inside, this, inside our technology here. Um, additionally, uh, you could then say maybe collapse all this over time and say, I don't care about moment by moment, but on average over some period of time, how do they distribute their attention? And then you can use that using heat maps. So here, uh, heat maps kind of tell you that as a group or as an individual where people sort of divided their time, areas that are redder, uh, were looked at and investigated longer, deeply. Uh, green less so and, and no colors means they didn't look at it. Uh, and then finally, you might do things like uh, draw an area of interest box. So these are like custom areas that are saying like, I really want to know how they looked at this. So this button, this mini map, this on-screen element, this reward, uh, screen. Did they look at it? How did they uh, explore that screen? And here you can draw on top of that that element and say, hey, uh, you know, how quickly was it to, for them to actually move into that box? How long did they spend in that box? Out of everyone I tested, uh, how many of the people went into it as, as, as the audience size, quote unquote, over time? Um, how thoroughly it was explored going in through there? And these can all give you different types of, of insights into the way that it's broken down. Uh, but it doesn't, insights don't give you research questions. So you, so you should use the, the, the types of insights in order to then drive the types of research questions that you might want to answer. And unfortunately, is my game good is not one of those questions. However, uh, knowing a little bit about the output, you could then think about things like, well, does my new interface design make it easier for me to use a, a feature? So you could think about like, okay, well, the time to first fixation, you can draw an, an area of interest box, test a variety of individuals and say, hey, have you, uh, have you been able to find that as a, as a group faster? Um, you, could, uh, you could do an A-B uh, type of testing. So you can have a, your old design, your new design, have a bunch of people play that in a randomized design and see which one it is for e to find them easier to use, quicker to, to, to attend to, uh, quicker to actually implement. Um, you could answer a question like, is my screen too cluttered for a player to effectively process information during some event? So, you know, you have a, a, a screen or you're inside the gameplay and, and uh, you know, you're trying to say, hey, you know, let's, let's, let's get them to, to, to click on this object over here. Again, areas of interest, time to find can, can help you understand those types of information there. Uh, you could ask a question like, you know, did they notice this when, when during the gameplay when it appeared? Uh, think about, uh, you know, you're designing a, a game where like there's a, a power up or, or some sort of functionality that you're saying, hey, uh, if they use this function, uh, it'll give them some sort of awesome power that they can go in and, uh, and gain an advantage towards the other players. Um, for some reason, they're not using it. So, so you know, why are, are they not notice? Are they not noticing that that feature and not understanding it, or are they simply just not noticing the fact that it's charged up and ready to go? And again, you know, you can use areas of interest, time to find, in order to then isolate those types of questions um, and, and answers for those. And then finally, you could understand things like maybe uh, is my game interface easy to learn? And you can use the heat map in order to uh, to, to diagnose. And I've got an example of that on this uh, this next section here. So uh, in this heat map, uh, you can see that uh, this is my gameplay. Again, I, I just analyzed my first and single round of jumping back into uh, to CSGO here. And so the, the uh, experience kind of was divided up into like, okay, navigating the Steam interface, getting the game set up. Uh, and then if you're not familiar with the CSGO kind of uh, workflow, uh, there's a game set up momentarily at the beginning of the round where you pick your guns, you jump into the gameplay, kill, kill, kill. Uh, and then you get a reward screen going in there. Uh, so this was my first sort of uh, shot at the, the first time looking at the new uh, setup screen, the new loadout. 
And you'll notice that first off, um, you know, this is the very first uh, level of the game and uh, I don't have any money and I never looked at that. So uh, there's a reason why I'm also looking at the rifles, which are all overpriced and so I can't spend any of that money. But you do see that, you know, my attention is then distributed across a wide variety of things. I'm looking at the different gun options, uh, some of the details, some of the teaming information down here at all. And so what I mentioned earlier before was that, you know, you could in theory use this in order to sort of gain an idea of like your, your, your level of expertise. So you should be able to expect this distribution as your player gains experience to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So less of these areas, because I now know this information, I don't need to look down here or I don't need to look down here. I may only want to look at these areas. And so you can use the changes of the way that this heat map is distributed as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as an assessment of, well, how easy is it for my players to gain uh, mastery uh, of this interface? And if they're not doing it in the, in the time that I'm expecting, Thing, what changes can I make to drive that and actually then use that to drive your, your testing uh, going forward and looking at the different sort of learning curves essentially for each of those. Um, additionally, you can look at it from what's called as the area of interest. Again, you draw out specific areas and then just look at the statistical data uh, around what that actually looks like. So again, as I mentioned earlier, I never actually looked at the, uh, the funds of the, uh, the tool set and that uh, looking at the wheel was kind of what I was kind of looked at most. Uh, you can see here with the time to first fixation, which is the time it took for my eye to actually go into this object uh, was the shortest or the quickest to, uh, for the wheel. And then next I checked out the, uh, the team status and then finally went down to the, uh, the weapon details on here. So my, my journey kind of went this way. And in doing so, uh, you know, I can understand a few different things. First off, like team status, uh, right at the beginning, I didn't look at it for very long, even though I did look at it uh, for, for a moment. And so the question is then, you know, there was no value for me in, in looking at it in this particular screen. So I just kind of moved on uh, quickly to the, to the next object. And then I spent a significant time looking at the different uh, statistics of the weapons. Um, in doing so, I'm able to then say, oh, well, you know, how quickly I, was I actually able to focus in on the details of, of the weapons before I had to actually start playing the game? And if you're not familiar with this workflow, they only give you a few seconds before your teammates start running away. And then you have to like, oh, I, I have to choose between actually playing or uh, continuing to read this. And, and typically, you know, most people just could oh, I, I need to jump into the game and, and start shooting uh, first before I actually fully understand. But then they're still putting it up to a choice between uh, actually reading and understanding uh, what your capabilities are and then jumping into gameplay. And so, uh, which gives you kind of a, an interesting conundrum. Valve, not a sponsor. Any questions? Uh, oh, right. So what are some of the methodologies that you can use from uh, uh, at home these days? So uh, again, I wanted to mention that everything I did on this game currently right now, I did from, uh, from home. So basically everything I ran was like, pretend you could get like a game developments, you wanted to test it yourself. You could essentially have uh, all these sensors available to you in as a laptop. Again, here I am in, at home in my, uh, in my bunker here. And uh, you could then apply all these uh, uh, tools and tracking uh, easily with, uh, with this uh, set here as well. So that's, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, but if you wanted to, uh, to of course bring in like consumer uh, levels of information, so bring in like user testing from from other uh, sets there as well. That's a little bit there. Oh, uh, PowerPoint just uh, just crashed. Uh, hold on. While I reboot PowerPoint. Okay, uh, next you might want to try to understand like how people use different uh, uh, elements on the screen. So there's the, uh, the mini map. Let me uh, actually bring this up. Uh, so one thing you might want to be interested in is uh, uh, how people and players actually use uh, different elements on the screen. Uh, it's relatively easy to do this with a variety, 
wide variety of different technologies. Uh, so you go in, you draw a circle around the minimap, it gives you overall time spent. Again, this is for that one round. So as I played that round, I spent about three seconds there. And that's that's a useful insight. So um, as a, between expert and novice players, there's a distinction that you, the, the more that you use the minimap, the more effectively they use the minimap, the better that you're going to play. Because it gives you information, things like enemy player positions when they're firing, where your, your teammates are and such as that as well. And so you could essentially use this as a way to sort of distinguish um, levels of, say, uh, skill learning. So how long does it take again for them to go from novice to experts and, and distribute their, their time spent on the minimap? But there's a little bit of a pitfall in that as well. So because um, as you become better at it, then you're actually quicker to process that information. So rather than sitting there and, and, and actually processing that information, uh, more expert players will also kind of look real quick, gather information, and then they're back into to the gameplay. So rather than just looking at it uh, simply as just a whole sum, uh, what's better is to then actually break down each of the viewpoints as, uh, as part of that journey. So here, every time I looked at the map, uh, this is my entire like, gameplay session. Uh, you can see it actually then you know, displayed here, and then I'm not looking at the map, I'm looking at the map. And you can see early on, I'm using it actually quite a lot. I actually leveraged uh, some experience. But then there's this huge uh, like novice section where I just completely forgot to uh, use the map at all. I'm too... too uh, too involved in getting shot. I'm too involved in, in just learning the gameplay and the mechanics and, and figuring out how to uh, to make you know my, my gameplay effective again, that I'm not using the minimap at all. Again, this can drive into things like different types of behavioral profiles that you might use in order to help under, understand, well, you know, what's that expertise uh, curve, uh, that, that, that momentum that they're getting in order to that. To, uh, to achieve uh, tools. And then in doing so, when you go into development, how can you then adjust those curves? How can you make the map bigger, smaller, uh, change things, adjust uh, different visualizations in order to help sort of adjust the curves so that people adopt your game easier? Or if they're, if they're already there, how to then uh, adjust the game so it's not as annoying to, uh, to, to deal with when, you're, when you already have that knowledge. But for research, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Heather, what uh, you mean, but for research, um, but I would sometimes, you know, I sometimes see these methods applied in what looks like inappropriate or plain or bad ways. Can you recommend anything I can point at to help prevent my organization from using the wrong methodologies? Uh, absolutely. Great question, Heather. So, um, that's, that's kind of the, the conundrum with it is that, uh, you know, if you don't have experience in it, what I've seen uh, large large companies before AAA titles, what they do is they end up hiring uh, new staff, new new, uh, new new neuroscience researchers that understand the methodologies and then uh, help them. Uh, otherwise, then they'll either like hire a company like mine in order to help teach the existing staff to uh, to do it and, and 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 navigate these pitfalls. Otherwise, yeah, it is kind of like. It, your own, your own to sort of uh, learn the, the ins and outs of this. And again, uh, these types of forums and, and conferences would probably be your best source for that type of information uh, that's out there. Um, otherwise, you know, there's a variety of free uh, resources that are out there. Um, my company has uh, just a bunch of pocket guides that you can download as PDFs that kind of dive into a lot of these, uh, these conundrums. Um, otherwise, you know, talk to, to uh, just email me and, and we can definitely have a conversation about it. So the next methodology that I want to kind of dive into uh, briefly is the um, the facial expressions uh, there. So I actually had that in uh, on at the same time. Um, if uh, facial expression technology, if you're not familiar with it, is essentially the use of uh, video cameras in order to assess different emotional faces as they're being displayed uh, during testing. So um, there's a number of different uh, engines and technologies and softwares out there. Um, and I'm not going to go into the, the pros and cons of any particular one of them. Uh, but uh, essentially, they all kind of work very similarly. They, they take a webcam feed. And uh, they stream that, that video feed, and then there's some AI to mark up the face, detect different types of features that are related to different emotional states, such as eye tracking, uh, eye location, um, uh, like the, you know, where your lips are. And then they're, they're doing the same similar things to what you as a human does. So their, their detector is sort of built into the software that says, is this a joyful face? Is this a fearful face? Sadness, surprise, contempt. Uh, and things like that. Um, I also want to point out the the engagement metric and the valence metric, which are sort of overall um, uh, categories in the affectiva engine, which I'll be uh, sort of demonstrating today. 
Um, engagement is, you can think of it as just like a differentiation from normal because uh, they, they, when you're sort of deadpan, uh, you're not going to be having any, uh, any, any pings on any of these uh, levels of emotions. Engagement just kind of looks at, is there anything active there at the time? And so, uh, you know, what you can think of it as is just something that's sort of a difference from normal uh, or a difference from boredom. So are they, are they activated or excited? It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Uh, are they just not, are they just reacting in some specific way? Uh, additionally, you can look at overall valence, which is sort of a combined metric score that takes all the, the positive and, and negative uh, feelings and sticks into one scale. And so as they're more positive, whether that's joy or, or, or uh, surprise or things like that, it'll go up. And then if it goes uh, disgust or sadness, it'll go under zero. And that's a really nice, useful concept versus diving into each of these individual uh, categories, which is a, a pitfall that I've seen a lot of people kind of fall into. Because... Uh, I'll kind of get that in just a moment. Let me actually dive into the live example uh, at the moment. So, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and come up with uh, with our version of uh, facial expression detection. Ha! <laughs> Wow, voice crack. Anyways, uh, so this is me uh, coming in live and you can see the outputs coming in. And again, it's drawing in the, the outputs uh, quite quickly. And so as I'm playing my game, pinging uh, noobs with headshots, uh, it's able to, uh, to track the different emotional context as it comes across my face. And again, as alluding to the issue earlier, so uh, by analyzing it frame by frame by frame, you now know like sort of a, a insight or a window into my emotional state. Uh, on every page, on every word, uh, on every sort of uh, frame or section or event that occurs within your game in order to get those insights uh, going. Um, these are all built on, um, on lots and lots of other data sets that you can actually access, things like brow furrow, uh, um, smiling, uh, cheek raising, dimpling, and things like that. Uh, that you can also get access to if you want, but these are sort of the emo large emotional categories. But I do want to, again want to focus in on this engagement and valence metrics, which are the easiest to sort of understand because they're the most broad. So uh, with engagement, if I kind of go deadpan, which is this gray one, you see it drop off here at all. But if I make any sort of movements and if I'm just kind of bored out of my mind, it's, it's zero. But if I go like, ah, this is not, this is not good, or ooh, I'm being shot at, these will, this will fire off a sort of interesting thing, which I feel like has a lot of value in, into some of the ways that my clients uh, sort of look at this data set as well. And it sort of accelerates that, that learning easily. And then valence, positivity, and negativity is it's easy to understand like what that sort of lends onto it, though, if they, if they really like it or if they're going into it. Unfortunately, uh, emotions aren't as simple with that as, as that. Uh, first off, that that you know, facial expressions are complex emotions. Uh, they're they're not a pure barometer of that person's emotional state. They're a communication tool uh, that has emotional state as one of the the factors. But there can also be things like uh, communication demand scenarios. Uh, so this is actually uh, the data set that that I actually have when I'm playing the game, and it's. What's a, a seductive, easy thing to do when you get like, oh, I've got a facial expression engine, I'm gonna test my level, and uh, yeah, if it's more joy, people will be super happy if, when they play the level, and if my joy hits 100%, then my game will be perfect, and, and it'll be good. And it's like, uh, no, that's not how it works. Uh, and, and you can see that from, from this data set as well. So uh, I can report that I did thoroughly enjoy the game, but there was almost zero positive facial expression as, as uh, indicated. Uh, by this uh, black and blue bar, I actually had more negative facial expressions, especially during gameplay over here on the left. And on the right hand, you see the just the match results screen coming in right there. So I actually had a, a bit more negative results. Um, and then this this results is is indicative of the fact that that again those those uh, emotions are complex. Uh, taking into account games like Dark Souls that are out there that you know brutally punish you uh, and, and and do so much player rage. Uh, are they bad games? Absolutely not. Uh, people love them for that specific reason. And that if you tested them at any point in the game with facial expressions, I'm sure it would be all negative uh, all the time. But that's, that's also the point. So again, that's why I mentioned earlier that things like any emotion, whether it's positive or negative, might be a better indicator of whether they're, they're, they're happy or engaged in your game versus, versus nothing. The other thing to notice, and uh, when you're doing facial expressions, is this large amount of uh, 86 and 88% neutral face. That means just I'm not really making any sort of face one way or the other. And that's something to also be aware of when you're using facial expressions is that, um, you know, human beings uh, are not 
by yet built as to respond socially to screens. Uh, we'll see how millennials take it in the in the future. But uh, right now, you know, when you're looking at media, when you're looking at television, when you're looking at video games, um, unless it's a special type of like social video games, most of the time you're not going to be making any sort of facial expressions. You're going to be concentrating, and the, and that sort of brain power is going to be uh, you know used to uh, to try to make headshots rather than oh I need to be uh, social here. And so, uh, but that doesn't mean that the, the little moments of facial expressions aren't important. In fact, it means that any time that there is a facial expressions, that makes it even more important because then it's, it's kind of breaking through that sort of zombie face mode and then indicating really closely, oh, that's a really powerful signal that's indicating whether or not they're, they're indicating it. It's just don't be hung up on positivity or negativity per se. So what, so what questions can you answer with facial expressions? So um, again, I'm going to go back to my, my first round of CSGO uh, back in the day. And so here uh, we can see, like when we start off with the, uh, the, my, my Steam thing and the fact that they're trying to sell me on my Prime status ad. Uh, and then I move over to things like the map loadout when the game is loading, uh, the, the loadout screen where I'm loading up my character and choosing my weapon, and then the actual gameplay out there. Um, the eye tracking was on, but uh, for now, we'll just look at the data sets here underneath. And here we're looking at two specific signals, the, that engagement signal. So was there any sort of facial expressions, neutral, 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 positive or negative, and then this information going on. And then additionally, I'm looking at, uh, for, for this was a, a blink detection rate. So whenever I blink, you can see the, uh, my blinks kind of showing up here as well. This can also be done through facial expression detection. And so the question that I'm asking here is, uh, was I immersed in the game? So that, you know, game immersion is something that I'm sure a lot of people are interested in. And so uh, by looking at the, that this information, you can begin to see like, okay, well, you know, in the beginning here, there's some like boring information. I'm just kind of uh, getting into the game. You can see my reaction rates. There's high amounts of blinks. Uh, there's some uh, emotional engagement. I'll explain this one in, in just a moment, uh, but it's kind of dispersed and far apart. And then you can see that, you know, as the gameplay actually falls in, uh, more and more engagement occurring and, and less and less blinks occurring. And then you can use this information then as a barometer to say, hey, how engaged in the game during the gameplay they were going. Now, you know, comparing the, uh, the, the loading screen to the gameplay screen isn't, you know, a, a, you know a, a huge revelation by any means. But again, you can apply this to any A-B testing scenario, whether you have uh, a, an old version of a level with a new version of a level, uh, your game versus somebody else's game, uh, some tweaks that you, you did to your new level in order to drive like different levels of engagement uh, on average across the group. Um, if you take these individual sections and then you just take the average of each of them, so the, the prime account uh, section, uh, whenever the map was on the screen, the loadout menu, uh, the actual gameplay match, as well as the, the result screen, and you just took the average of them, you actually can get an understanding of sort of that emotional investment journey that, that I took when playing this level. So at the beginning, there was the Prime account uh, coming in through there. I don't like the fact that they were trying to get me to buy stuff, so I had some small uh, uh, emotional reaction. Uh, the map was, wasn't very interesting, but as I went through, uh, you see that, that increasing in emotional investment as, uh, as I played. So I got more and more into the game as I went along, which is something that I think is what they desired uh, going into it. But here you're able to then um, uh, visualize that and get qual uh, quantitative data um, dictating exactly how that, that emotional journey kind of took under place there with, uh, with this data. And this is again, repeatable uh, and, and objective against everyone that plays this game. Um, the final tool that I used was uh, skin conductance response in order to uh, do that. Um, so if you're not familiar with skin conductance response uh, before, it's essentially using uh, a device to measure the, the amount of sweat uh, on your palm. I know, again, there's a, there's a few other talks here. I think uh, Natalie is having a talk at 2 o'clock uh, PST, so um, I think she'll probably go into this. Uh, but to not, uh, so I'm going to pull back a little bit about the details, but in a very high level, um, the, the amount of sweat on your skin is related to a number of different factors. So there are things like, you know, the temperature of the room, uh, your circadian factors throughout the day. Uh, but additionally, it's tied into your nervous system. So your, your fight or flight symptom, uh, system um, uh, that, that we're all very familiar with, that reacts to, 
to external stimuli, such as, you know, threats, uh, adorable things, things that you might be interested in and there. And it's able to then react and, and execute a, a level of sort of the, your stress or quote unquote physiological arousal, not just, not just this arousal. And by doing so, you're, you're able to then get a sense of exactly, you know, how interested, how, how uh, exciting something is in going or how boring something is over time. Now, we already have facial expressions to, to kind of give us a moment by moment, you know, positivity and negativity. So what would doing galvanic skin response or electrodermal activity in this case do for you? Uh, and then how do we measure that? Um, well, if you're familiar with the concept of, uh, of a multimeter, if you've ever used one before in the past, essentially these are all kind of similar tools that do things in the same way. Essentially, there's two contact points on the body somewhere uh, that measures a, a resistance across those two points. And then as you begin to sweat more, uh, that resistance goes down. As we know, sweat is uh, electrically conductive. And then in doing so, you can then get a sense of, okay, well, you know, they're sweating, they're, they have an increased arousal. We can then transmit that to the computer and, and record it. Um, there. And then if you have the ability to then synchronize that to specific events, uh, you can gain insights. Uh, but again, that is the actual challenge is that synchronization. Uh, if we look at this, uh, so what do we actually get down top of facial expressions? So facial expressions will give you a nice measure of, you know, whether they react positively, do they react, re react negatively, were they bored? Uh, but it's not really good at looking at magnitude. So were they just a little bored? Were they like, you know, just a little bit excited or were they just blown out of the water? Uh, what GSR does is that it's really uh, nicely scaled to your emotional state, and that's really hard for you to sort of fake that. So there's, there's interpersonal differences, there's intercultural differences in how much facial uh, reactivity there are. So you can't use the size of a smile really to tell the size of joy. But you could use GSR and the size of a smile in order to say, okay, well, they smiled, uh, but they didn't have any sort of skin response. So it's not really much of a, an emotion felt. Whereas uh, they could have a huge skin response saying, oh, they really, really uh, dug that, that particular event scenario. And so by adding on this one other dimension, now you can look at uh, not just how they reacted to it, but how much they reacted to it. And again, uh, the, the other one, can, that other talk later, uh, she can probably uh, go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, but again, the challenge is interpretation. What you get out of it is just a series of time data on a graph. And how do I then turn that into insights into the game? Well, the first challenge is to then actually synchronize it to a specific event. Uh, note that uh, with GSR data, uh, there is a delay between when you actually see something and when that, that, that response actually occurs on the skin, typically about three to five seconds. So that in itself can sometimes cause challenges. Uh, so you need typically some sort of software in order to, uh, to drive uh, that, that sort of synchronization of that, or you can then uh, figure it out through timestamps, uh, which you'll have to have some sort of marker there before. Uh, but what you do get, and I don't want to dive too deep into the, the data set there, is that the point of this graph is that you know, it's, it's not a, a simple uh, analysis. Uh, typically software is used in order to pull out what changes are occurring. And people might be tempted to just look at these uh, overall uh, global changes, uh, also known as the tonic changes, but these are actually more related to things like uh, skin temperature changes, or perhaps you, you pressed a little bit uh, you know, harder on the, uh, on the electrode versus emotion related changes, which are typically more transient and reflected in these little bumps here, uh, which most of the time get detected through algorithms. Um, there's a variety of algorithms that are out there if you want to get into it. Uh, our software has one built into it um, using our notebooks, but there's like Lita Lab from MATLAB and a variety of uh, softwares out there from the sensory manufacturers themselves will help you again. Uh, but again, without some sort of tool to actually synchronize that to an event, you're going to have to either use timestamps or, or something to figure that out. Um, I've got another example uh, back in the software. So if I dive back into that real quick, any questions uh, as I bring this up? All right, so here we have a, uh, a, an example within VR here. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the VR uh, person experiencing uh, this nice calm VR scene. Uh, we're gonna ignore the eye tracking for now, but here we've got, again, their GSR uh, signal, and then we've got the algorithm picking out all the, the number of times. And typically people either respond like the number of these peaks or the size of the response and the bigger the, the response. And so you can see as the person is in this nice calm VR scenario, uh, there's, there's relatively uh, few uh, GSR peak activations. Uh, I'm sure the, the environment itself is still pretty cool, so you do see some. 
but then you see like you know these these uh, smaller sort of uh, reactions but then you see uh, this this change in not only the uh, the, the tonic rate but the, the baseline rate but the, the the sizes of the reactions are more and bigger uh, as it goes into it and what that is is uh, you can see it reflecting some sort of change in that person's uh, environment so it goes from this uh, this calm sort of oceans uh, riverside to, to something a little bit more uh, engaging uh, physiologically. Uh, in doing so, uh, typically clients then report things like the number of these uh, by specific level. So you can imagine this was uh, one level and this was your, your new level and like, oh, your new level drove so much more response, had bigger responses, it had many more responses going in there saying that uh, if it was a positive response saying that, oh, players really, really loved it. Or if it was a negative response, ah, the new changes didn't work. Players really, really hated it. Uh, in doing so, you're able to then get a much more sort of, uh, again, uh, nuanced way of looking at the type of responses you get from, from your user testing. So uh, going back to my examples, uh, what are the exciting moments that I found when I actually went back and looked at my, uh, my, my single round of uh, CSGO experiences? So there were two significant responses that I, that I had uh, underlying there. The first was uh, this marketplace uh, thing right at the beginning. So I, uh, I opened up the marketplace uh, by clicking on a button and it was trying to get me to buy things. Uh, I had a reaction because uh, I didn't know how to close this window. So I was a little bit frustrated, like how do I get back to the game? Uh, the second response was the actual uh, match uh, result at the end. And I actually had some mixed feelings with this one because uh, if you can see closely, uh, the, the bot actually carried me to the win. So yes, while I was, I won and I was relieved that my team quote unquote won. Again, this is my very first match in like years. Uh, there was some mixed responses of just like, hey, it was, it was cool, but I didn't really do anything to help the, uh, the team win. But again, uh, this is a, just kind of highlighting the fact that you can then use the GSR in order to find what were the personally, the significant moments uh, throughout the, the experience, uh, not just what I can remember, what I can report, but what was actually uh, sort of expressed and felt uh, on my skin during the gameplay. Um, in doing so, I can then divide up the, the levels. So maybe I had, say, uh, two different levels that I'm trying to test again earlier. I mentioned that you could do like A-B testing scenarios. You have a, a new version of your level that you think might be more exciting, might increase the franticness of your gameplay or might have better rewards. Uh, you could then go into uh, you know, dividing up that gameplay scenario and, and seeing exactly how much of a response difference there were. Here, what I did was I simply just divided up my gameplay experience into the setup screens. Uh, so like, you know, the, the loading screens, menu selection, uh, the choosing the loadout, and then the actual gameplay section on the back end. So, uh, you know, shooting and, and the, uh, the, the match result. When you look at the differences here and there, you can actually see that, you know, between the gameplay, uh, not surprising that there's a, a lot more responses for the gameplay than there was during the uh, setup portions of the game. And that the response size on average was, was larger uh, than the, uh, the setup screens. Uh, not, again, not such a, a huge uh, surprise, but uh, you can imagine applying this again to new designs, custom levels, uh, comparative uh, games, uh, um, responses where you've, you've changed up your UI in one way or the other in order to drive whether or not, you know, the, the players uh, enjoyed or more immersed or were uh, more invested within one uh, area or another. So uh, just to conclude, uh, there's you know a lot that you can know about the questions, uh, but don't get uh, distracted so much by the shiny new technology uh, that you get away from asking the fundamental questions about what you can actually answer from those tech tools and technologies. So with eye tracking, things like ease of use, uh, what was driving attention, with facial expressions, you can look at that emotional journey and what drove emotional engagement without the game. And then with GSR, think about questions that involve things about int uh, emotional intensity and the, uh, the relevance for that. Um, that concludes my study. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Uh, if you, I'm going to be writing this up as an article a little later, so if you want this uh, as, a, as a written uh, thing, I'll probably be publishing it on my uh, LinkedIn page pretty soon. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, look it up on uh, look up my company at iMotions.com and, and uh, we can talk about it there. Or you can ping me directly uh, at, my web, at my email. All right, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, if we have any questions, uh, 10 minutes, please, uh, please fire away.
Uh, yep, so uh, look forward to that article pretty soon, uh, Zian. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll post it on, uh, on LinkedIn and uh, you know, I'll, I'll share it out. So feel free to, uh, to, to uh, engage me on that. Okay, but for research, uh, again, Heather, I'm not really sure uh, what your question is, but uh, we'll see. And again, so uh, everything that I wrote here, uh, did here for this game testing, I did in, in my house. So I was able to leverage like, uh, you know, tools that I could carry with my pocket, eye trackers, uh, galvanic skin responses, and actually take them home with me. Uh, if you actually want to uh, leverage actually testing remotely, other people, like say you want to show them a game, that becomes much more tricky because like they don't obviously have the tools and technology at their house and the location. Um, there are approaches that you can use that are, that are kind of complex and things like that. So you could essentially uh, do facial expression tracking over the internet through web conferencing softwares that we're using here. Uh, and then show them something you, you can imagine like, you know, just like I'm showing you this, uh, streaming and then giving you a reaction to specific gameplay scenarios and that and that, that that might be possible as well fortunately eye tracking again or, or galvanic scene response won't be really practical for you to to try to do in a remote data collection scenario because they don't have the sensor going in through there um, that being said in the future there may come into that so I do know that you know there's companies and softwares out there that uh, say that they can extract out a heart rate uh, from the camera by looking at the flushing of your face. Um, and there's other companies out there that can that can look at that type of information out there. So um, just they haven't matured as of right now. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, just ping me up if you have any other things and uh, have a nice rest of the day and uh, you know go forward and look at those talks. Be safe. Thank you so much, Nam.